Good morning and happy November 1st. If you're like me, you might have gotten out some warmer clothes. It's just a little bit chilly, but it feels good. It's fall. Uh, I'm not going to complain. My sister out in Colorado had about a foot of snow this past week, so this is very pleasant here. I'm glad you're joining in this morning on your device. And uh, if you feel free and if you can come at nine o'clock and we'll have Sunday school in person at the church. Today, our lesson is going to be from Isaiah chapter 46. Now, last week we ended in chapter 40 with Isaiah's prophecy that Judah would be exiled to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness and their idol worship. At the time, the 10 tribes of Israel, the northern part, had already been exiled to Babylon, and now Babylon had its high set on Judah. They had already conquered some of the outlying cities, but they hadn't gotten to Jerusalem yet. But it was uh, prophesied that they would overcome and that the, these people would also be exiled. And uh, during their exile, it was foretold that they would feel completely abandoned by God as if he had forgotten and he turned away from them. For today's lesson, we actually skip to chapter 46, but the chapters between 40 and 46 give Isaiah delivering some powerful messages, um, and he emphasized God's power in contrast to these man-made idols that the people had begun to worship, and he assured Judah that God would, if they turned to him, would strengthen them, he would redeem them, and he would restore them to their homeland if they put aside their idols. And just one little section in those chapters, but I would encourage you to read some too because they're very, it's very encouraging. But I want to read just one little section and it comes from chapter 41, verses 10 through 13. So, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And those are just some powerful, encouraging words that God would say to his people. And he says to his people today that he would be with us and we, we're not to fear. But Isaiah continued his prophecy by reviewing how totally powerless idols were. They were just man-made objects. They used materials, if you remember the scriptures from last week, to make a mold, and then they would cover it with um, a precious metal, silver or gold. But uh, And they would take wood that would not rot to make the base so that the idol could actually sit and not fall over because we see that the Philistine gods fell over and that was a little bit disturbing to them. But in these scriptures, in these chapters here, it says, but even that material that was used, you had some leftover. And what did you do with the leftover? It was just everyday, ordinary material. They would burn it and they would use it to cook their meat and to bake their bread. Yet what they had made from it, they worshiped. But still, even in all of this, they were encouraged to sing a new song because they would be redeemed and they would be restored. And this was mentioned multiple times. He says that Jerusalem would once again be inhabited. It's going to be destroyed, but it would be inhabited and the towns of Judah would be rebuilt. And not only would Israel be redeemed, but through them, through the lineage of David, the kings, redemption would come for the entire world. To restore Israel, God was going to use Cyrus of Persia. He, that would, he would be God's shepherd. Now, Cyrus and Persia did not recognize and worship and honor this God. They had their own pagan gods. But God assured Judah that he would lead Persia to overcome Babylon 
and release them from the captivity there once they were all taken there. And Cyrus did in the future overcome Babylon and he did free the Israelites to return to their homeland. So our lesson today begins in chapter 46 and the first verses are three through seven that I'll read now. And you read along with me in your Bible. You may have a different version. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age I am he, and even to whore hairs will I carry you. If men grow beards, and you know when those gray hairs start coming in, they might feel a little bit wiry. Women, too, when the gray hairs come in, they have a little bit of a texture. That's what he's referring to there. In other words, when you get old and you're getting gray hairs. And I have made, and I will bear, even I will carry, and I will deliver you. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me, that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith, and he makes a god. They fall down, yeah, they worship. They hear him, they bear him upon the shoulder. They carry him and set him in his place, and he standeth. From his place shall he not remove, yea, one shall cry unto him. Yet can he not answer, nor save him out of his trouble? It seems at the time there was a religious festival in Babylon, and they had some pagan gods, and they would take their pagan gods. One, one was Nebo, the other was Baal, I think is how you pronounce it. Marduk was their chief god. But they would decorate these gods, and take, they would take them off their pedestals, put them in the carts, and parade them around the city. And obvious, these gods had to be carried around. They had no power to move themselves. Now, I looked around in my house to see if I had some kind of figure, and I found this. Because remember, last week, we uh, he, Isaiah covered the steps in making it. First of all, you would make a model. Now, this is a little a figure of uh, a grandmother holding a child with a quilt. And I think it's actually called the quilt. It's a willow tree, and it's called, the name of it is the quilt. Now, if you know my mother, you know that she made quilts, and that she just loved to make quilts. She loved to cook collards, and she loved to make quilts, and she loved her grandchildren, and she made quilts for everybody in the family, for all of her children and for her grandchildren. Some of her great-grandchildren probably have some of her quilts. And when I started having grandchildren, I decided I would try to make a quilt. And I did make some baby quilts, nothing big like Mama did. And uh, this was a gift to me, and it's very special. And every time I look at it, it reminds me of my mother because of all the quilts that she made. And then it reminds me also of my grandchildren because, but I sit this down, I can sit it, somewhere and it has to stay there it can't move it's very special to me and it represents something very special but i don't worship it it sits there i can look at it and i can think about my mother but it can't answer me if i talk and it cannot solve any problems for me if i if i have any so this is the very kind of thing that they worshiped this was made from a mold, and it's not covered in a precious metal, but it's painted, and it represents something very special. But can you imagine having something this in your house, and, and you worship it? And that's exactly what they were doing. So Isaiah delivered a message for the house of Jacob to listen. And he said, when he said listen, he meant really take heed of these words. Don't let it just hit your ears and bounce off, but let it go in, let it internalize. He said God had born this nation like a child through Abraham when he made the first covenant. He created the nation of Israel. Without God, there would be no Israel. There would not have been because Israel, the whole nation, came from the uh, descendants of Abraham. And he said, not only did he do that, but he carried them from birth, from the time that it was just Abraham and Sarah, until their old age, he carried them, and he wanted them to remember this. He carried them out of Egypt, 
through the wilderness and into this promised land that they possessed. Now, parents and children, God carries, we carry our children. When we have children and they're young and they're babies, we carry them. And finally they get to where they walk and then they grow up and they stand on their own. And sometimes the roles begin to get reversed. When we get older, our children begin to care for us. But that's not the role that God had. He said, I have had you since your birth, and I will have you until your old age, all the way to the end. And in verse 5, he asked a rhetorical question. He said, who are you going to liken God to? Who are you going to pair, compare to God? God created the universe. He sustains us daily. And how foolish it would be for us to put trust into a man-made object. We think we take so much for granted when we wake up in the morning, the sun comes up or there are clouds. We take so much for granted that God is in control of. And he said, how can you put your trust in a man-made object when God controls the universe? It was sad that they would take their gold and their silver and their hard-earned valuables or money and they pay a, a goldsmith or another person to make an object, and they would take it home, they would set it up just like I take this home and I sit it up there and I can look at it every day, but they would begin to worship it. They could pick it up, they could put it in its place, but it couldn't move, it could not cry, they could cry out to the idols, but the idols could not respond and it could not save them in times of trouble. No matter how big, or how decorated they were. Now, remember in this religious festival, they decorated the idols and they paraded them up and down the streets for everybody to see. But now we have to be careful when we start judging people about idols and things that they worship because idols might not always be a physical item. It can be an attitude or an activity, anything that takes precedence over God in our lives. It's anything that uses up our time and energy and leaves us with no time and no energy to communicate with God. It's anything that does not allow us to use our talents in any way to serve or to live with a sense of worship and gratitude toward God. It's anything that allows us to think that we are self-sufficient, that we have been successful, or that we have accomplished on our own. We might think our education did that, or we might think that our natural abilities have done that. Anything that takes precedence over God could be an idol. Now, our next scriptures come from verses 8 and 9. He said, remember this, and that means don't just think of it. Remember it, and remember it by taking an action. He said, remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O oh, you transgressors. Now, these were the people that worshiped the idols, the transgressors. Remember the former things of old. This would be before they began to worship idols. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Remembering here was a sense of... Uh, simply not just simply bringing things to mind from the past but it means to take an action about it what they were to remember was the worthlessness of the idols and they were supposed to reject the worship of them that was that that was what they were to remember and then that was the action they were to take and then they were also to remember the things that god had done in their past and take action which would be drop those idols and turn back to god Remember the things that God had done that had brought them to where they were right now at this time. None of those pagan gods had been with them in the past. They weren't traveling with them in the wilderness. They did not release them out of slavery from Egypt. Egypt. And these uh, pagan gods would not be with them in the future either. Only God had been with them from the very beginning, even from creation, even from the materials that they were using to make their idols, God was there. He created that. He would be, he was there then. He was there with them in the present. And he was the only God that would be with them in the future. Now in the next scriptures, Isaiah reminded the people that what they were experiencing 
and what they would experience in the future was not a surprise to God. He knew what was going on. He knew what was going to go on before it ever started. He, it was what he had predicted and what he had warned them about many, many, many times. So the next ones are verses 10 through 11 that say, declaring the end from the beginning. There are very uh, few things that we start and we know what the end is going to be when we start it. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it. it will, I will also do it. From the beginning, with Abraham, even before that, God had a plan. And he had announced his plan for the nations. And that at the time that, that Isaiah was speaking to the people of Judah now, he was actively bringing about the plan that he had made. It was not surprising God what was happening. He had repeatedly warned his people if they failed to turn away from their sinful lives, they would be exiled. In fact, the entire book of Isaiah is full of scriptures about warnings and about their idol worship. These people had strayed so far from God. But it was also filled with lots of words of hope, too, for a time when Judah would return to their faithfulness. And God said, none of this is happening by surprise. And here's what's going to happen. He's going to call in another country who was hungry for power. He called it a ravenous bird. And when you hear the word ravenous, you think, well, you're just starving. But this is a ravenous bird. It was a power-hungry opponent to Babylon that would carry out his plan. Cyrus was about to overthrow. He was able to overthrow Babylon only because that was God's plan. It was also his plan that Cyrus would release the Israelites to return to their native land. Everything that was happening and everything that would happen in the future was in God's plan. It was in his hands. It was in his plan. All that he planned would be completed. He said if he planned it or if he spoke it, he would do it and they could depend on that. Now, our last scriptures are 12 and 13. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are far from righteousness, that's far from a right relationship with God. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Zion referred to the temple and to Jerusalem. It isn't God's desire to punish his people. That's not what he would like to do any more than it's our desire that we just want to beat up and punish our children. We love our children. When we do punish them, and when God does punish his people or correct, it's to correct a misbehavior. The intention of the exile was not just to punish the people. It was to have them turn away from becoming uh, hard-hearted and stubborn. He didn't want them to worship idols. It, the purpose of it was to have them drop the idols and turn back to God. And he was speaking to a bunch of hard-headed or stubborn people. And even with what had happened in Israel to their, to their relatives, they were all uh, descendants of Abraham, all the 12 tribes. And those 10 tribes of Israel had already been taken out into exile. And some of the cities of Judah had already been overcome. Even with that, some still didn't believe that God would do what he said he would do. But we found out in last week's lesson, remember, God fulfills his promises. They're good promises. We want him to do that. But what he says otherwise, that happens too. And they still didn't believe it. But even their unbelief, even they could keep on saying, well, I just don't believe that God's going to do that. I just don't believe that God's still in control of everything. That unbelief would not stop him from fulfilling his plans. Some in, captivi in captivity 
would believe or think they were going to never worship in the temple again. The temple represented the presence of God to them because of the Ark of the Covenant being there. The years of the Babylonian captivity were hard, but a day of deliverance and restoration was going to put an end to the exile in Jerusalem and the temple would be rebuilt. And not only would it be rebuilt, it would be rebuilt in splendor that God would control. It says he would put his salvation in Israel, in Zion for Israel, my glory. It would be to God's glory. So it would be a splendorous rebuilding. Now this lesson should teach us the importance of remembering what God has said and done. You could read those chapters between chapter 40 and 46, and you can see all the, the warnings, but you can see all of the hopeful scriptures too that bring encouragement. And we can look back at history. They couldn't at the time that Isaiah was talking to them, but we can look back in history and say, all of these things that Isaiah prophesied came to be, they happened. So we can believe what God says. And it certainly, this lesson should cause us to heed the warnings given to God's people in the past. And they're just as relevant to us today. We might not go out and build an idol or pay for somebody else to make one for us. But sometimes we have idols that we don't even realize. We might have to check our attitudes and our actions. Um, we, and whatever controls us, whatever controls our lives. And remember, he told them to remember the things from the past. When we reflect on what God has done for us in our past, it helps us to build our faith. And it gives us more reason to trust him in our present and in our future. We pray a lot of times, and I know you do, we all do, for specific requests of God. And those prayers sometimes are answered in our favor, exactly how we request it. And when it happens, sometimes we just quickly forget that God did that. We ask, he delivered. And we forget to be thankful when those prayers are answered for us. We should never forget that God cannot be compared with anything else. There are some things in our lives that are very important to us. They're very special. But when you put it up on the scales or balances beside God, it can't be compared. He's more awesome than our minds can clearly, clearly comprehend. If you think about all the wonders and the miracles of our everyday life that we just assume they're going to happen, you could get so bogged down until it would be mind boggling really that because we can't even comprehend how everything operates. I want to thank you for joining in today. And if you can join us in person, that would be great. It's almost the same lesson, a little bit different and you get to participate. But either way, I hope you'll have a great week and you'll keep the election and our nation in your prayers from this lesson today. We know that God's plans will prevail even if he uses ungodly people to execute them. Cyrus was not a godly, righteous person, but he was used by God to fulfill God's plan for the people of Judah. And I hope that you'll continue to keep safe and Let's don't let down our guard when it comes to COVID. And I have another special request. Unless he decides to make an appearance early, our little Reuben Green third is going to meet us face to face on Tuesday, the 3rd of November. And I hope that you'll keep his mother and his father and all of the family in your prayers that it will be a safe delivery and that we will all be role models for that little precious one. And do you know, you think about it, God already has a plan for that little boy. He's not even here yet, but he's, he already knows him, and he's got a plan for them. And I want to thank you for joining in today, and I pray, pray that you'll have a blessed week.